folks. Well, uh, for you, it is morning. For us, it's not. This is being pre-recorded. Uh, some of us are at a unified service uh, with about 20 other churches. Um, and so we thought for those of you who could not make it, that this would be a wise way to ensure that you're uh, engaged in worship and receiving uh, the word on a Sunday morning. So we want to begin by uh, looking to Jesus, who is our wisdom. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, the Apostle Paul, he states this. He says, For Jews demand signs, and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Gentiles, Christ is the power of God and he is the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. In this text, we have Jews who are demanding a sign. They want uh, either some sort of political sign or some sort of sign written in the sky, you know, that here's this Messiah, this Savior, the Gentiles. They want this kind of cerebral wisdom to win the day. And yet, as Christ shows up on the scene, Christ really does neither. He provides them no political sign for the Jews, and he gives nothing of some heavy head knowledge to the Gentiles. And yet it's Jesus who is, yes, something of a stumbling block to both. But for those who come to faith, to those who have their eyes open by the Spirit to consider Christ, Christ becomes for us life and wisdom. Uh, he is everything, ultimately, for the Christian. So this is the one to whom we want to look upon. He is for us wisdom, not only the know-how of every moment, but he is the one who gives us understanding and meaning for all of life. He is the one, as we've talked about, who does establish the meaning, the significance, and the security that our hearts so desperately desire and so desperately need. It's Christ who is our wisdom. So we're going to take some time wherever you're at, to just kind of reflect upon who Jesus is for you, uh, and then we'll take some time to worship together. Father, we thank you for the incredible gift that you've given to us in Jesus. Jesus, you are perfect wisdom for us. You are the one who defines for us what life is all about. You are the one who, who, who comes down to us when we're, we're lost, when we are like sheep that are astray, when we aren't looking for you, you came looking for us and you accomplished for us what we could never accomplish for ourselves. Thank you, Jesus, that you are the Lord and Savior of our lives, but now you become the lens through which we understand all of life. Um, so Jesus, we thank you that you are wisdom. And, and yes, in a world that looks upon you and looks upon you as something that is foolishness, um, God, we say, let, let us be those who trust in Christ and even be looked upon at the, by the world as being foolish in order that you might receive the glory. So Jesus, we want you to receive the glory in our boasting this morning. Uh, we, we want you to receive the glory in our worship. We want to glorify you. We want to lift your name. Be glorified. And God, I pray if there are any who are kind of watching in who, who would say, yeah, this Jesus thing does seem a little foolish, God, I pray that you would do the glorious, miraculous work of opening their eyes to see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Would you show them the glory of wisdom, we pray. So we exalt you, we worship you. You are the wisdom 
that our hearts so desperately need. We look to you in Jesus' name. Amen.
thank you that you are our God who reigns and we thank you that you are the solid rock upon which we can put our trust and build our lives Spirit of God I pray that this morning for each one who is watching and listening Lord that they would put their trust in you that they would put their trust in the wisdom that is given by your spirit true word of God, Jesus Christ. Lord, you do reign forever and ever. And we celebrate that this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning, folks. If you're hanging at home, once again, this is a pre-recording, so... uh, Right now, this is Friday afternoon, evening, but it's good to be able to utilize technology. So for those of you who couldn't make it out to the unified service, uh, can still benefit from some sort of scripture intake and worship. Um, these times are just not ideal whatsoever. And so um, it's, it's important during these times to uh, utilize the technology that God has given us, but then pray, pray that we would have the opportunity to, in the very near future, gather together uh, as God's people. I'm looking forward to that time where we can just all gather into the building with loud voices, celebrating the things of the Lord and rehearsing His truth uh, together. So we look forward to that day, hopefully in the near future. Um, This morning, what I want to do for you is just kind of finish out the addiction series. And so I'd ask you to turn to Proverbs chapter 9. So far in this addiction series, what we've done is just a brief overview of uh, addiction from a biblical perspective. And then what we've done is dive down into like the specific issues of the heart of addiction, specifically then seeing that illustrated through the life of Zacchaeus, but then also dealing more specifically with the issues of of shame and pride that are often in this interplay within our own hearts. Uh, And and last week, then, we started backing out of that that diagnosis and and looking at the need for community and how we help one another in in the struggles of addiction. Uh, But finally, I want to continue to broaden things out and and give you more, again, of just like a general perspective uh, for uh, how Scripture would view addiction and and the struggles that we find ourselves often in. Proverbs 9 does just that. So I want to read the chapter, and then we'll jump into the text itself. Uh, Proverbs chapter 9 reads this. It reads, Wisdom has built her house, She has hewn out her seven pillars. She has slaughtered her beast. She has mixed her wine. She has also set her table. She has sent out her young women to call from the highest places in the town, saying, whoever is simple, let him turn and hear. To him who lacks sense, she says, come eat of my bread Drink of my wine that I have mixed. Leave your simple ways and live and walk in the way of insight or wisdom. Whoever corrects a scoffer gets himself abuse, 
and he who reproves, uh, reproves a wicked man incurs injury. Do not reprove a scoffer, or he will hate you. Reprove a wise man, and he'll actually love you. Give instruction to a wise man, and he will still be wiser. Teach a righteous man, and he will increase in learning. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. For by me your days will be multiplied, and years will be added to your life. If you are wise, you are wise for yourself. If you scoff, you alone will bear it. The woman folly is loud. She is seductive and knows nothing. She sits at the door of her house. She takes a seat on the high places of the town, calling to those who pass by, who are going straight on their way, saying, whoever is simple, let him turn and hear. And to him who lacks sense, she says, stolen water is sweet, and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. But he does not know that the dead are there, that her guests are in the depths of Sheol. Let's pray, and we'll jump into the specifics of this text. God, we're grateful that you would show us very plainly uh, what it is that we struggle with in this life. Thank you that you would speak into our situation so clearly. Thank you that you hold nothing back. Thank you that there, there is a way of wisdom to the many times in which we've just followed the way of foolishness. Thank you, God, that you would be so kind to call us back into that place of wisdom. Thank you that, Jesus, you embody that wisdom. You are true wisdom and life uh, for us. So I just pray that even right now, for those watching in, I pray that you would give them something of wisdom according to your spirit, that they would hear from you ultimately, not from me, that they would hear from your words and not from my words. So God, I, I invite you to come and work among us now. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, Proverbs chapter 9 depicts the experience of our life. And it, the reality is, and how it's pictured, is that all of our lives stand at this crossroad. This crossroad between, as we see in this text, the woman wisdom who is calling out to us, as well as then on the other end, you, you have this woman folly who's also calling out to us. The fact of the matter is that we all live our lives, if you will, at this crossroads between wisdom and foolishness. Uh, life carries with it this inevitable choice, this crossroads. What will we do with our lives? How will de we define and determine the meaning of our lives? How will we establish a, a sense of significance and worth in this life? How do we seek to establish security for our life amidst the everyday threats and confusion, especially in our own season that we're living in? How do we navigate all of this from moment to moment? We stand at a crossroads. The experience of life is one of constant, ongoing decision. And so the question stands for us, even as we read this text. What path will we choose? Now, earlier in this series, this series on addiction, we, we defined addiction as self-selected bondage. That at the core of addiction really is a, a choice, a choice that is being made, a choice then that ends up in slavery. We emphasize the fact that addiction, according to Scripture, is this choice choice. And, we, and, and I know from our cultural kind of backdrop that, that there are uh, controversies surrounding that particular idea, that addiction is a choice. Within our culture, it's oftentimes that addiction, well, is, is this disease. It's, it, it's something that doesn't necessarily entail with it the, the depths of personal responsibility that we should own when it comes to our addiction. Uh, when we consider it as a, as a disease, what we tend to do is kind of focus on the outward things rather than perhaps the inward decisions that we are making on the level of the heart. And so 
it's, it's those decisions, it's the level of the heart that, that, that we need to take responsibility for because even as this text will prove, it's those who take responsibility for their choices that God actually gives grace to. He actually gives wisdom to. He actually gives life. When we own up, when we take responsibility for our own decisions, that is the beginning point of, of walking this path toward wisdom, walking this path towards change and transformation. Now, I also want to be careful as we close out this series that when it comes to addiction, there's far more involved in the experience of addiction than just some sort of, uh, some sort of choice. Obviously, addiction begins with choices. It begins on the level of the heart, but there's far more involved there. And, and I just want you to recognize that the, the uh, book of Proverbs takes all of that into account. While it speaks very simplistically about choices standing at these crossroads, it also entails the fact that, yeah, we've, we've come through a lot. Uh, there's much pain, there's much hurt that oftentimes those who struggle with addiction find themselves in, sometimes because of their own choices, but most oftentimes because of other people's choices. They carry this hurt, they carry the shame, they carry the turmoil, the internal chaos uh, of the pain. So it's important that we would recognize that even the book of Proverbs it, it realizes this, that it's not as though we stand at this crossroads with some sort of blank slate, you know, we're, we, we come with all our pain, with all our brokenness, with, with all our sin. And so even as we would recognize, the book of Proverbs begins the first nine chapters, and it's all about this fatherly figure who's instructing his child. And so even when it comes to this idea of making a choice, it, it takes into account all the brokenness we, we, we bear, but it also takes into account the fact of a loving father, who wants to instruct us, who wants to care for us, who know, he knows we're not gonna be perfect. He knows there's gonna be failings. He knows there's gonna be relapses. And yet it's all about his tender fatherly care that comes alongside and helps us to walk down the path that he would choose for us to walk this path of wisdom. So what I'd like to do with you in the remaining time is, is consider this crossroads of decision and how we then kind of walk this path of, of change and transformation. So first, the crossroads. The author of Proverbs places the reader at a crossroads. And from uh, the distance, the, the reader is to hear uh, these voices kind of erupting at this crossroad. One voice is Lady Wisdom, the other voice is Lady Folly, right? So now Lady Wisdom in verses one through six is this brilliant character who seemingly has the best advice for all the issues of life. So in chapter one and in chapter two, Lady Wisdom is more or less this, this moral counselor who comes alongside of the individual who's struggling, and, 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 and she gives this wisdom, she gives this counsel, this moral counsel to preserve this individual from, from violence or from kind of messing up his own conscience. Then in chapter three, she acts like a financial counselor. She actually has things to say about our money and about our possessions and about work and how we're actually supposed to handle all of that stuff. In chapter four and chapter six, She's like a guidance counselor. Through all the ups and downs and trials of life, she's, she's giving us direction and she's giving us guidance. In chapter five and chapter seven, she's a bit of a marriage counselor, even something of a sex therapist uh, for, for us. So she's, she's giving us insight into relationships and how we can maintain sexual purity. And even in chapter eight, she's something of a spiritual counselor. So you see this, this lady wisdom just doesn't show up in chapter nine, but she's all through the first nine chapters and she's actively working for the good of the reader. And it's not just that she's a counselor, but she is the way the world 
was wired to work. She's embedded in creation as a reflection of the character of God himself. We see this in chapter 8, beginning in verse 22. You begin to see that the Lord possessed wisdom, and wisdom now is being exercised in the creation of all things. In other words, creation has a particular order and design to it given by God. There's wisdom then that is to be applied so that creation is utilized correctly. And so this is what wisdom is. She, she is the way the world was wired to work. She's embedded in creation as a reflection of God's own character and attributes. Wisdom is a reflection of God in creation. And therefore, to reject Lady Wisdom and her kind of created purposes is in fact to reject God and his created purposes. But to walk in wisdom, even as this text would say, is to fear God and to live in harmony with his created purposes. It's to live what we know to be the good life. It's as if, it's as if Lady Wisdom is actually saying, here's how you actually live your life out in this world so that it's most harmonious, so that it's best for you and most honoring to God. So wisdom, if you're following with me, wisdom is like, on one hand, a path, right? She, she's the one who's crying out, come this way. So she's something of a path, as we see in Proverbs chapter 9. It's a way of life. But it's also that Lady Wisdom is like this cosmic truth counselor, right? In chapters 1 through 8. But then it's also like she is something of, of life that's embedded into creation. Wisdom, if you're following with me, wisdom is the way. Wisdom is the truth, the truth counselor. And wisdom is the life. Does that sound familiar? The way, the truth, and the life. Who do we know to be the way, the truth, and the life? Who, who is the way? Who's the door? Who is the narrow path but Christ? And who is this cosmic truth counselor, the Prince of Peace himself, who teaches? Even as we see the life of Jesus, he shows up on the scene and he ends up as a 12-year-old boy hanging out in the temple. And what is he doing? He's, he's teaching the scribes and, and, and the religious leaders. And he, he's stunning them by what he knows. He is this truth counselor, as he grows up and begins his, his ministry, he's stunning the crowns with the authority that he has in his teaching. He is this truth counselor. But we also know from, from Scripture, John chapter 1, Colossians, Hebrews chapter 1, that Jesus is the one who actually created the world. He actually is the one that Proverbs chapter 8, verse 22 and following, is talking about. That Jesus is the one who created all things, who holds all things and sustains them by the word of his power. But he's also the one in his, in his life and ministry that actually gave of his life so that it might be true when he says, I have come to give life and to give it abundantly. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the true embodiment of wisdom. We could say, in some sense, that Jesus is Lady Wisdom. And the only reason that it's a lady is because wisdom in the Hebrew is feminine. And so the personification becomes a woman. But it's right to see Jesus as the fulfillment. He is wisdom who is crying out for us to come to him, for us to come and surrender our life to him. And so, so notice, notice in Proverbs chapter 9, what Jesus, what wisdom has done. Verse 1, wisdom has built her house and hewn her seven pillars. In other words, the idea is that there's been a lot of work that has gone into establishing a stable, restful place for the weary traveler. Right? But then there's also food. 
There's rest for the weary traveler, but there's also food, nourishment. What else has she, has she done? She has slaughtered her beast, mixed her wine, and set her table. In other words, she's paid the price, she's prepared uh, the means, the, the food, and now she has set the table and she's sending out these young women to, to these crossroads so that they might declare whoever is simple. Literally, the idea is whoever is needy, whoever is poor in spirit, come, eat of my bread, drink of my wine. Does not Jesus do these very things for us? Does he not cry out in Matthew chapter 11, verse 20, 28, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He came. He came to us. He did the work necessary. He came from heaven to earth to establish for us a place of rest, a place of rest fundamentally in him. But then we also hear from John chapter 14, he didn't just become for us rest, he went to go prepare us a place of rest. And so this is the work that Jesus has done. He is wisdom. He is setting up, establishing a place of rest. Rest for our souls in one day. Rest for our bodies. And does he not say, does Jesus not say also that he is the bread of life? He's the one who gives eternal food to the hungry soul, John chapter 6. So he not only... He not only builds his house and hews out these seven pillars, this place for stability, this place for rest, but he's also the one who provides the meal. He's paid the price. He lays down his own life so that we might find something of forgiveness and uh, even relationship with him. He is the one who gives this eternal food, who declares, I am the bread of Life. So, so what are we to see here? We're to see that Jesus is wisdom. We're to see Jesus crying out to the needy of heart, saying, come, if you have need of heart, come and find satisfaction with me. And notice also, this, this, this call to come to Lady Wisdom, this call to come to Christ, it's all free. Lady Wisdom has paid the price. It's Jesus who came. And what does he say? Does he say, okay, here are the things that you have to do to come to me? No, he's actually going to the needy. He's actually going to the oppressed, the ones who stand marginalized. And he's coming to them and he's saying that there's no need for you to kind of put yourself together. There's no need for you to pay the price. You need to come and find satisfaction of soul with me. He's the one who actually goes the distance for us. He's the one who goes to the cross on our behalf. He's the one who overcomes death itself so that he might be able to truly say, come to me and find life and find it abundantly. This is what Jesus offers to us. It's free. There is no work. Christ has done it all. He prepared the place. He has set the table. It's all free, and he simply bids us to come. Isaiah 55, as a precursor to the coming of Christ, would say, come and buy and eat without money. <laughs> it's to say, like, come and sit at the banquet feast and eat without having to pay anything because it's already been paid for you. That's what Christ has done for us. That's what, if we, if we could say, Lady Wisdom has done for us. It's all free, but also we have to recognize that it's reserved for the needy. It's reserved for the simple. In other words, the criteria for coming onto the path of wisdom and taking rest in the house and finding nourishment for your soul through what is provided means that you have to actually acknowledge that you have need, that there is simplicity of heart. In other words, that you're poor of spirit. That you're looking, I need, you're saying, I need satisfaction of soul. That is the criteria for coming to Christ, for walking the path of wisdom. We have to humble ourselves. 
You have to say, God, I stand in need. And if I don't have you, what do I have? This is the voice of wisdom. This is lady wisdom. This is Christ calling out to us to find satisfaction of soul. But of course, we stand at the crossroads. So what's the voice on the other path? Well, throughout even chapters one through nine of Proverbs, there's a competing voice, and it's the voice of folly. It's the voice of foolishness. And the fool or the woman folly in Proverbs is one who lives for the moment despite knowing the consequences that will come later. The fool lives for the moment despite knowing the consequences that will come later. The fool realizes there's going to be consequence to one's action. There's going to be difficulty ahead, but the satisfaction of the moment outweighs the consequence that will one day follow. The Bible simply calls this foolishness. It calls it empty-headedness, to not recognize the consequences that will come for immediate satisfaction, for immediate payoff, says is foolishness. It's empty-headedness. It doesn't make sense. Well, this is Lady Folly that we see down in verse 13. And she's described as being loud and seductive. Literally, she's filled with hot air. She, she's always kind of billowing smoke, always billowing these words that, that just never stop. And these words take on a seductive kind of temperament. They, they, they take on these lies, kind of tickling the ears of, of the listener. And she does exactly what we've explained throughout this series as to what idols do. What do idols do? They make promises that they can never satisfy. And we believe them. We buy into the lie of the idol. So what does Lady Folly do? Well, she's loud and she's seductive. She makes promises of rest and satisfaction, but has actually nothing, nothing to prove of an established home. She's done nothing like uh, Lady Wisdom has done to prepare a home and establish a house of rest. She's really, when it comes down to it, once again, she's the equivalent of idols who make kind of big promises but can never truly provide. She's looking to capture the belief of our hearts to make us think that she really has something to offer when she doesn't. And what does she do? She's not only loud and seductive, but she is, verse 14, she sits at the door of her house. Literally, it's the place of the prostitute in that day. They'd sit or stand in the doorway. They'd put themselves forward then to impress, to catch the eyes of those who were on their sojourn, those who were traveling by. And while Lady Wisdom, on one hand, had built her house, had hewn her pillars, had done all that work to actually provide a place of rest. All that Lady Folly does is dress to impress. It's all this superficial seduction, these promises that say, hey, come here to find immediate satisfaction. Come here to find something of intimacy. Come here to find rest but there's no true resting place with her. There's no true relationship. There's no true intimacy. It's all false, and it's all empty. And while Lady Wisdom, remember, she's cooked up this meal. She's stirred the wine. She's done all this wonderful stuff. She's paid for it. She's made a way for it. Verse 17, Lady Folly has stolen water and bread to be eaten in secret. In other words, she owns nothing. She's done nothing to establish herself. She's only just stolen from others. It's like there's supposed to then be some sort of invigorating uh, feeling about the wrongness that has taken place. Because that's where the secrecy, there's, let's eat this in secret. There's, there's something that, that sin will do in exciting our hearts. And that's the appeal that she's making. Hey, I have stolen water and bread. Compared to the meat and the mixed wine 
that Lady Wisdom had. Oh, here, here is much less, but it was stolen. And so there's something of this secrecy. There's something of this sinful excitement that should be enticing to us. But the fact of the matter is even this sense of excitement, sinful excitement, it doesn't, once again, produce anything profitable. It doesn't truly satisfy. It actually kills. It's not without consequence. It actually kills. It breaks life. It takes life. Just notice verse 18. It might have been enticing and its wrongness, but the reality of it is that it is this banquet set in the grave. Right? Literally, it says that the walking dead are living in the, in the home of woman folly. It's almost like this banquet, this place of secrecy is in a grave. It's sunken deep into this grave, and that's where their enjoyment is, is found. But it, it's depicting the fact that it's, it's, it's like walking in death. It's like placing yourself in the grave. It's the fact that this way of life will inevitably lead to destruction. It'll inevitably lead to death. And so often the experience of addiction is just that. It begins at a crossroad. And it begins then with a voice saying, hey, you can find satisfaction here. You can find relief here. You can find a way to cope here. You can find something of excitement and temporal pleasure here. It begins at a crossroads. Then it begins by the invitation and this enticement and before you know it we're bound to the grave we're bound to that which breaks and takes life it's the way of folly so this is the crossroads that at least scripture says we we all face we all walk down life is a life of decisions again and again and again and again and, and, and again and again, it's a crossroads. Which way will we go? Will we follow the voice of Lady Wisdom or will we follow the voice of Lady Folly? This is the crossroads. This is the journey of life. This is what we walk. Now, the question then is, how are we to know which path we are on? How do we do a little diagnosis of our own kind of walk? Where am I leaning in the moment right now? Well, check out verse seven and following. What we find here is the test of correction, right? If, if, if you pass the test, then you're leaning in the right direction. But what's the test at hand? Well, the fact of the matter is that those who stand at the crossroads are, are never in neutral, right? We're always leaning one direction or the other. We're always beginning to follow after Wisdom or follow after folly. The heart of man is never in this place of neutrality. Even as we saw last week, our heart, if it doesn't, if it's not holding on to and anchored in the truth of Christ, it's inevitably drifting. And so what we find here is here's a way to know whether or not you're drifting. It's the correction test. It's the test that determines if wisdom is at work in you or if you're walking with lady folly. Notice verse 7. Whoever corrects a scoffer gets himself abuse. <laughs> Scoffers are those who don't want to hear the truth. They don't want to be confronted. And so what do they do? They, they get belligerent. They get defensive. They get manipulative. And they outright perhaps will get physical with you. They won't hear wisdom. They don't want to change. They don't want to be uh, instructed. They don't want to receive correction. And therefore, when correction comes, the heart becomes defensive. And if the heart is becoming defensive, you know which way you're leaning. That you're leaning towards the way of folly rather than the way of wisdom. But if wisdom's at work in your heart, notice verse 9. You're going to humbly receive correction. Those, you have to think through this. 
those who already have rest in Christ, right, receive correction without feeling as if they're losing out on some sense of meaning, significance, or security. To, to, to find your rest and security in Jesus and then to have someone else come and bring correction to you, it, it, it's not as though you're losing out on anything. If there's true correction to be brought to you, guess what it gets to teach you? How to go deeper in your rest in Jesus. It teaches you how to go deeper in wisdom and it tells you how to go deeper in life, right? So those who are leaning into the way of wisdom, walking the path of Lady Wisdom, will receive correction with humility. Why? Because it's going to make us more righteous, it's going to make us more wise, it's going to lean us in more further to the rest that we already have in Jesus. Those who walk the path of wisdom, they realize that correction will draw them further into the rest that they already have in Christ. If Christ is really your source, if he's really your life and wisdom, then correction will only lead you further into him. There's no need for defense. There's no need for de deflection. There's no need for manipulation. No, I want more of Jesus because I've tasted and seen that he is good. I've tasted the fact that he has been the satisfaction of my soul. And therefore, if I'm drifting a little bit and someone says, hey, Look out. It's like, man, I want that correction because it's going to get me further into Christ. It's going to anchor me to the true satisfaction of my soul. So this is the difference then between the fool and the wise. One will invite correction, and as correction comes, oh, it's the one who is wise that will walk in transparency. They're not going to attempt to hide. They're not going to attempt to defend. They're not going to attempt to manipulate. It'll be to say, hey, push me deeper into Christ because I've come to know that he is my perfect security for my soul. So maybe the questions might be, what are the areas of life where you tend to defend from critique? Perhaps those are the areas of life that perhaps would cause you at certain points in time to be tempted to lean into the way of folly? What are the moments when you feel as though correction is threatening? Is it in the workplace? It is, is it on the block? Is it in the church community? Is it with friends? Is it with family? And why the insecurity? Why the insecurities there? Are you trusting Jesus who says, I'm, I, I, I define you. Your work doesn't define you. Your achievements don't define you. Relationships with others don't ultimately define you. Your relationship to Christ does. And remember, that comes freely. You've done nothing to gain it. And therefore, it's as if we, we can't do anything to lose it. Because there is complete stability, complete security in Christ. I didn't come into the house of wisdom. I didn't come into the community of faith. Because of my achievements, I made it there upon the achievements of Christ. I came with the needy soul. That's all I had. And therefore, when it comes down to it, if Christ is my true security, then I can take correction. I can take instruction. So, what are the moments when you feel as though correction is threatening? And what do you do with it? What do you do with it? Do you seek to defend or do you lean into Christ so that you can be vulnerable and go deeper with him? Finally then, what the text then shows us is, is even, when, even when it proves that our hearts are kind of wandering away from the Lord, maybe we're leaning into folly and we're making some decisions that aren't right. They would actually be the very pathways that would lead us to our old addictions, for instance. How, how is it that we get back on the right path? Well, what we have is, is this call to get back on the right path, verse 10. Verse 10 states this, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now, if you've read through Proverbs, you've come through that statement again and again and again and again. How, how do we become people of wisdom? Well, it begins by fearing the Lord. And what does that mean? What does it mean to fear the Lord? What does it mean to fear Yahweh? 
Well, it doesn't have this idea of kind of curling up in the fetal position in fear. It has the idea of reverence and awe. Why? Because he's Yahweh. He, he is the self-existent, self-sufficient one. He, he is that which upon uh, everything depends for its essence of life. In Acts 17, it gives us the description. He's the one who gives life and breath to all things. If, if I'm dependent upon him for life and breath right now, there, there's something of fear and awe that I should have toward him. Right? There's something of an awareness of my deep need for him. You, know, you, you, you make the connection with the fact of a breath comes from him. How, how much do I need a breath? You know, I jumped in the pool with the kids uh, even last night. And as we're, 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 we're trying to see who could stay underwater the longest. And, and we're, we're, we're coming up, you know, gasping for, for air. We desperately need that breath. There's almost a fear, if I stay under this water, this is not going to go good for me. And that's the idea here. It's a desperation to say, God, I need you. Without you, what do I have? If you are the one who gives life and breath all things, if you are the source of wisdom, oh, how desperate I am for you. I must come after you. I must lean into you. You must define, you must determine uh, life for me. Th these are not things I can determine on my own. Of course, Proverbs 3 speaks into that, that we shouldn't lean on our own understanding, but in all of our ways, we should acknowledge him and he's going to direct our path. And the promise that he puts out to us is it will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. There's going to be a satisfaction of heart that is physiologically felt. When we think about addiction, there are spiritual choices that we make that inevitably have physiological implications. We were made that way. But on the flip side, God says, you, you begin to follow me and, and make the right spiritual decisions and fearing me, and, and having me define life, it will have physiological implications. It will be healing to your bones and refreshment to your flesh. So when it comes to, hey, recognizing that in some way I feel as though I'm becoming defensive, I, I'm, I'm becoming manipulative, I'm walking down this path of seduction, this path of foolishness, how do I get back? Well, I have to recognize first and foremost my need because that's what the text points out. You got to humble yourself. But then secondly, you have to fear the Lord. You have to give him rightful position to define everything in your life. For the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You need him like you need air, right? So you lean into him. You go after him in humility, recognizing, yes, I've I've gone the wrong way. And once again, the context here is a father who's speaking to a son who knows that there's going to be failings, there's going to be mess-ups along the way. But the father is so gentle, so careful. He is one who comes alongside of his son and continues to give instruction. So when it comes to humbling ourselves and fearing the Lord... Within that, you're going to meet the loving arms of a father who can carry you when you don't know what to do with yourself, who can supply direction, supply instruction, supply hope and healing when you can't supply it yourself. This is what the God of wisdom holds out to us. So when it comes down to it, we all stand at a crossroads, right? Jesus, I just hope you hear Jesus saying, come to me as the one who alone can satisfy. Remember, as we've talked about, if nothing in this world, as C.S. Lewis says, can satisfy our hearts, we must recognize that we were probably made for another world. We were made for someone bigger than ourselves. And that is Lady Wisdom who calls out, saying, let me satisfy, let me be your rest. Let me satisfy your hearts. 
And that is exactly what Jesus then comes to embody. He is the wisdom of God, even as we saw in our call to worship. He is the one calling out to us, saying, hey, I can satisfy your thirsty soul. So we all stand at a crossroads. Jesus bids us to come. But even in times where we feel ourselves learning, leaning towards the way of folly, there is a way of correction. There is a way of correction. We can humble ourselves and know that we can fear the Lord. For that's the beginning of wisdom. God calls us to come, even when we've messed up, even when we've failed, that his call still remains to us. His fat satisfaction is still held out to us. As a father would instruct his son carefully, gently, giving him correction, but cor compassion along the way. So our God does the same. And ultimately we find that as we walk that path from folly to wisdom, that we come to find his arms are quite secured rest in. And the person and work of Christ is more than satisfying. May that be the case for us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you. We thank you that you speak truth uh, to us. Thank you that you haven't left us on our own. Jesus, what wisdom you are for us. You are the way, you are the truth, and you are the life. Thank you, Jesus, that you satisfy our souls. Thank you that you can make even such an exclusive statement by saying that you are the only way, the only truth, the only life. Thank you that you're not apologetic about that. But you hold yourself out as the one and only way, the one and only truth, the one and only life for our hungry souls. Jesus, thank you that that's not wrong for you to do. But thank you in saying that you are the only way, truth, and life that we do find satisfaction, and therefore the result of that is something of humility and compassion. We can receive instruction when we have failed. We don't have to be defensive. We don't have to be manipulative because you've satisfied our hearts, and that correction only drives us deeper into the things of you. So God, make us people who are guarded from the pathway of addiction but are who, who are good with receiving the correction so that we might find just an ever-growing satisfaction in the person of Christ. So help us, Lord. Help us, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Grace and peace to you guys. Uh, Announcements will be coming out throughout the week for uh, what we'll be jumping into throughout uh, the month of June, but we'll be looking forward to catching you next Sunday.